That is, maybe you'll take away one or two little pearls of wisdom. I'll just start by uh, telling you a little bit about my story so you understand who this is in the proper room speaking with you this morning. Uh, as a kid, I was always a very mechanical guy. I was the guy that you know, built motors in high school in the 70s and we drag raced muscle cars on Friday nights. And uh, most of my life I've raced motorcycles off-road and I've done all my own wrenching. Just always been a very mechanical guy. My goal was to become a mechanical engineer. Uh, but my education in mechanical engineering was cut short because I had to make a living. I worked as a welder and a machinist. But I had engineering schooling and so I knew how to read prints and I understood mechanical drawing and some things about material science. And I worked, worked for a factory and a manufacturing company in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, in two years' time, I achieved my first life goal. At 23, uh, they paid me $23,000 a year to be the plant manager. And that began a career. I, uh, that, that first goal was to make my age, in other words. But um, that began a career, eventually, of running companies. And in the 90s, I was recruited to run a company in this industry called Cerico Flexible. That's probably a name that some of you know. And, there's a, some great people in the room or uh, Sreco is a great incubator. Sreco is one of the oldest sewer cleaning manufacturing, sewer cleaner manufacturing companies in the industry. I think they're over 70 years old today, but you don't hear them much anymore. Sreco is an acronym for Sewer Rotting Equipment Company. In fact, 50 years ago, before jetting, Sreco was a sewer cleaner. It was analogous to a sewer cleaner. It's a lot like uh, uh, Xerox or Kodak might be. And, and probably for some of the younger people in the room, you wonder what the heck is Xerox and Kodak. <laughs> but Kleenex, we probably all know what Kleenex is, right? Kleenex is probably properly uh, facial cleaning tissue. Although I, I don't think I've ever heard somebody say, would you pass the facial cleaning tissue, please? <laughs> Although I did last night at dinner, I heard somebody actually said, uh, would you pass the great Mupon? <laughs> but, uh, but so Sirico was analogous with sewer cleaning and they made rotting machines. Uh, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, it's a, a monster sized cable machine. Uh, in the early days of sewer cleaning, we actually cleaned sewers with sticks. I don't know if you've seen the display downstairs, but if you haven't, go check it out. It's pretty cool. You remember Ed Norton? Anybody remember Ed Norton from yes. Money Blues? The original sewer cleaner? His famous quote was, sewer cleaners are like brain surgeons. We're both specialists. But in those days, they cleaned sewers with sticks. And the sticks had a sort of a, a fork and tongue connection and a scraper on one end. And an operator actually got down into the bottom of a manhole. And, and another, his helper, handed him sticks. And he would shove a stick into the sewer line connect the next stick, and the length of the sticks was governed by the diameter of the manhole, so they could turn them down into the line and connect sticks together. Sirico invented the rotting machine, which allowed us to do it mechanically with a long, pretty strong piece of wire. And the people who own Sirico, the family that I worked for, there are three generations in the business. I remember hearing the story that one day some crazy German uh, showed up at their factory, and he said to he said, I want to meet with the owners. I will revolutionize the way you clean the sewer. That's what he said. And they all had the big question marks over their head, uh, you know, curious what he meant. And he said, this vaso, with water. We clean, we clean the sewers with water now. And uh, the way the, the fellow I worked for tells the story, they threw Mr. Holloman out. They didn't believe you could clean sewers that, at that time with water. But look where we are today. How many people are involved in mechanical rotting at all today? I see a show of hands. A few, right? But all the rest of us are jetting. So he really did revolutionize the way we clean sewers. Um, I eventually left Sirico to form my company now, Advanced Inf Infrastructure Technologies, and I've always been a very mechanical and very technically oriented guy, so I focused our business on CCTV. I also recognized early on that, as much as I hated to admit it, most of the great innovation in our industry was coming in from Europe. 
and I made a commitment to learn what I could. And I began my first year in the industry going to the shows in Europe, and I've gone almost every year since. I went to go learn what I could about innovation. And I'll bring that up again. The reason I, I mention it now is because I will bring it up again. Um, it's, it, it has an impact on what we'll talk about this morning. So, uh, we're here to unravel some of the mystery about what works and why it works and how it works. Uh, although my business is selling equipment, I'm not here to sell you anything this, this morning. I want to try to help you understand a few things that are undeniable physics that are involved in what we're doing every day. And hopefully, you'll then be able to make a proper determination as to what tool is the right job for the job that you're on. It is very true that no one tool can solve every job, but the right tool makes all the difference in performing a job successfully. And with that said, I want to ask the first question of the group, you know, what matters in nozzles and uh, cleaning practices, and why should we care? I'll ask you, what are we out there to try to do each day? Would some of you agree that, you know, I want to do the best job possible? Can I get agreement on that? I mean, who this morning woke up and said, I think I'm going to do a crappy job today? <laughs> Anybody? I hope, I hope they're not the ones that are in this room. But do the best job possible might be a worthy goal. How about conserve resources and be efficient? For those of us who are thinking of sort of the higher consciousness, maybe we're sort of interested in being environmentally friendly in what we do. How about this one? Clean the pipe. Um, I told you a little bit about me. Please tell me a little bit about you. How many in the room are plumbers? By show of hands. A good number. How many are contractors that service mainline sewers? Larger than the laterals. And then how many are municipal? Uh, is everybody in the right room? Is there, is there any people here who, who don't fit one of those things? Is there something that I missed? Uh, I've, sort of, that's kind of the primary three that I deal with every day. Um, the issues, in fact, a young fellow walked up to me before the class just this morning and asked, is what we're talking about going to be relevant for plumbing? Whether we're a plumber or a contractor that services main lines or a municipality, we all have one thing in common, I think. There's some different things about how we do what we do every day, some different tools available to us, different problems, but there's one thing that we have in common in this room, and it should be, we want to clean the pipe. Can I get a, an agreement on that? that? That's job one. So your job is, let's clean the pipe as best as we possibly can. My job is to try to help you understand what's important in, in technology in order to be able to do that. So the first thing that we're going to, I guess, I should point out that there is a tremendous amount of snake oil out there. You're going to go out into that room full of uh, big, beautiful machines and lots of shiny booths. And um, there's going to be a lot of people uh, trying to pitch that their stuff is the best stuff. And in many cases, they have good stuff. But how do you know? And ultimately, our industry has survived. You've done a good enough job doing what you're doing, mostly because we're vastly overpowered. We're actually extraordinarily inefficient, is what we're learning. And we're basically doing this. Killing the ant with a bowling ball. And we've gotten away with it for quite some time. Because our machines are overpowered, we're paying for the water that we're using. We pay again to, to treat that water. We're consuming a lot of fuel and producing noise. And ultimately, we're just not being extremely efficient. But we get away with it because we're overpowered. And so we need to talk about several things today. You're going to see this incredible array of equipment out there all different sizes and shapes, and how do you know what's the truth? Answer a question for me. How many people will, I, I've had people say this to me, tell me whether this is true. 
I used the nozzle that the guy who sold me the machine, the machine, I figured he knew what he was talking about. Anybody relate to that? A few of us, right? Um, then the next, the next level up from that is, well, some guy told me that this, this thing is the best there is. There's always the, the, the great one, well, that's what I've always used, and it worked, seemed to work fine. But we've learned a lot over the years, and so now we've uh, taken uh, technology to a new level. And today, we're going to talk about the key attributes to a nozzle, to the design of a nozzle. What really matters to you? It's universal. I think you'll agree when you leave the room that things that we'll talk about, about the way a nozzle is designed, make great sense. We'll talk about the key attributes to proper jet design. And I'm not going to talk about rotation nozzles today. It's a different subject. I'm going to talk about static nozzles. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about rotation nozzles, either during or after the presentation, but, I, but I'm not focused on that. The importance of proper nozzle are orientation in the pipe and what designs make the best sense in given situations. If we have enough time, we'll cover that as well. So the first item, the key attributes to proper nozzle design, <laughs> Who here is familiar with NASCO? NASCO is the National Association of Sewer Service Companies. It's, the, it's, it's a, our industry's trade organization whose mission is to try to provide standards and best practices and uh, improve the quality of the work that we do in our industry. Pretty worthy goal. They're trying to help us be better at what we do and, and help us create some standards. And they have spent quite a bit of time on nozzle analytics and said, we're going to separate nozzles into three different tiers. And a tier one nozzle is a drilled steel nozzle. Um, when at Sirico, when we did make the conversion to jetting, uh, we would take a, a piece of stainless steel round bar and slice it into small little ingots and then run a big drill bit into one end of it, which would become the bore of the nozzle, and tap it for the thread, for the hose. And then we'd drill some small holes into the side at, at various angles to meet the center bore. And then we'd shape the thing, create any shape you want. And we would call that a nozzle. And 20 some years ago, you could have a nozzle, and you know, we'd make a batch of those, we'd send them out to the garden. And, uh, you could have a nozzle any way you wanted for a municipal machine, as long as it was 60 gallons a minute, uh, 60, yeah, 60 gallons a minute, 2,000 psi, and uh, five or 600 feet of hose. Uh, there was there wasn't just a much a lot of variability in those days. But again, that was pretty much the machine, the machines that we had back then. That was the spec. Now you have all different kinds of pressures and flows and hose lengths. You know, variable flows and variable pressures. Um, but so the, those former nozzles, the, the drilled steel nozzle, uh, was the first nozzle we made. And NASCO said, because that nozzle doesn't have a lot of flow characteristics and it's just very simple, we're going to call that the tier one nozzle. Um, in my trips over to Europe, I, early on, 20 years ago, I met a guy named Albert Enns. Do I have any Enns people in the room? Anybody from Enns? Yeah? Um, I, I, I don't think I'm wrong. I'm going to credit Albert Enns with uh, creating the insert nozzle. He was uh, certainly at the forefront of technology. He, he actually looked a lot like Albert Einstein. Um, and he created the first nozzles using re replaceable inserts. His motivation was that he was trying to find materials that were harder than steel that would last longer because it turns out the water is incredibly abrasive and would actually wear out the orifices of a nozzle and then the nozzle wasn't effective. In a second I'll show you a picture of one of those nozzles. But so we were trying to create, as an industry, trying to create nozzles that could last longer, could hold up to the rigors of high pressure water flow. And uh, that old drill steel nozzle we produced at Sirico, we sold at retail all day long for about $150. And the reality, and, and Albert was selling nozzles for $500 or more. 
five hundred. They went up to probably a thousand dollars back then, and uh, and they weren't really here in the U.S. yet. He was just beginning to come here to the U.S. Uh, but NASCO recognized that nozzles that had replaceable inserts would theoretically last longer because instead of throwing out the whole nozzle, you could just maybe replace the insert, or the insert material maybe was tougher and would last longer. So that had to have a separate distinction from Tier 1, and they called that a Tier 2 nozzle. But there was a great benefit from Albert's innovation, and that was there was starting to be some money in the business. If I sold a nozzle, uh, if, a, if a local dealer sold a nozzle for $150, we sold it to the dealer for $120. So the dealer would make $30 or $35 on it, and we might make as much. And I can tell you, not a lot of innovation goes into <coughs> your products when you're making 30 bucks. How much time can you really spend on engineering and design when there's no money in it? And one of the things that I give Albert Ennis great credit for is that um, now there was starting to be some money in nozzles. And today, we don't bat an eye spending a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars for a nozzle, right? It's really come a long way. And so, um, NASCO now said, let's look at the newest of designs, which are nozzles that not only have inserts, but also have some flow characteristics to it. And that's something that I'm really prone to, because you know, I was the guy who built motors. Porting and polishing a motor was a great way to get more air into an engine and increase your horsepower significantly, right? So if we could start to flow, create flow, um, we would improve efficiency. And that leads to sort of the first pearl of our talk this morning is that your job is to do the best you possibly can to clean the pipe. And I'm going to help you by one simple thing. My single focus is how can I help you deliver the maximum amount of energy to the pipe wall? You have, a you have an investment in a machine, right? Whether you have a plumber and you have a cart jetter, it's four or five or six or seven thousand dollars, you're at uh, you start to get to 2,500, 3,000, 4,000 BSI, and your flow is increasing. You're at uh, 10, 11, 12,000 dollars, 15,000 dollars for a jetter, or if you have the, the, the staple for plumbers today is probably an 18 gallon, 4,000 minute machine, and they're in the 50,000 dollar range, right? And then municipalities, what are combination trucks selling for now? Four and a quarter. Four and a quarter. <laughs> $400,000, huge investments in equipment. And so, kind of the, probably the first pearl is that drilled steel nozzle. Think about what the inside of that nozzle looks like, right? We have this blank and we set it on a lathe and we ran a drill into it that was probably close to an inch in diameter. And then we ran those little holes in the side. And picture where those holes reached the center bore. It wasn't especially efficient for flow, right? In fact, I can pretty much guarantee you that there isn't a single water molecule that left the hose and went into the nozzle and said, I got this nasty 180 degree turn coming up, I'm going to swing wide and preserve my momentum. You know, that's not what happens. What happens is that first water molecule fires up into the back end of the nozzle, which is shaped like what? Like a drill bit, like the, the, the tip of a drill bit. First water molecule hits the end of the road, and the second before it can realize what happened to it, the second one hits it in the ass. And there's this massive collision that goes on. And it's collision on top of collision, it's violent. And eventually, so many of them are shoved into that nozzle that some of them figure out a way to squish out those holes on the sides. And that's what I would call to, then it was a nozzle. Today, I would call it a POS. <laughs> Everybody got POS? You don't know, ask the guy laughing next to you. <laughs> but here's the point. Um, if I've got, you know, if I'm a small guy and I spent $10,000 on my equipment, or if I'm a municipality, I'm looking at $400,000 for a machine. I'm hearing the numbers are even bigger. We're looking at recycling machines and alternative fuel machines. We're going to be in a half a million dollars. They're selling them in, uh, in Europe for well over half a million dollars now. But I'm going to submit to you, first rule of physics, if you put a $150 POS on the end of your hose, you now have a $400,000 POS. 
You understand the importance of that? So when we look at the, the way this classification worked out, and I, there's some things I don't like about it, I'll, this classification, but it's a framework, it's a start. I'll talk a little bit about the things that I think vary. Um, but the key motivators and buyers for, for tools, for tier one, you're generally, you're that guy that says, how much can I get it for, you know, how much for cash, you know, uh, can I get the best, I just got it because it's the cheapest. It's okay, it might work, but first motivation is, or chief motivation for that person is first cost. Person buying a tier two nozzle may be saying, gee, I'm going to spend a little bit more and I want the thing to last a little bit longer. And then the, the key motivator for the tier three nozzle buyer is, I want the best performance I can get. And when you think about it, what does it cost to be out on the street today? If you're a municipality, you got a couple hundred thousand dollars in a machine, you have a crew of a couple of people, right? You have training, you have insurance, you have supervisors, management, you have liability. If I'm a small plumber, I've got a lot of money on my equipment, time is money, right? <coughs> uh, generally, customers don't want to pay because you sat there for four hours trying to get a drain on the clock. You know, a lot of the competition is saying, I'll clean any drain for X dollars. Seems like sometimes it's a race to the bottom. So, key motivator for tier three or the higher performing tools is I need the best performance. And here's why, when I look at a tier one nozzle, I was doing a class in Dayton, Ohio, and I was describing the way we used to design new nozzle designs at Cerico. And we had the standard radial nozzle, which was a real steel nozzle where all the jets were coming out the back. And one day, the, the uh, shop foreman came in and said, hey boss, how about if we drill a hole in the front of this nozzle and we can call it a penetrator, and then, so we'll have two nozzles, but we'll two skews now. And that's almost what it was like back then. That was kind of the science that went into it. And then a couple months later, the same guy came in and said, you know, if we sort of extend the nose on this nozzle and drill some holes around the head of it, it'll hit a blockage and explode it from the inside out. We'll call it the ultimate penetrator. And we just kind of thought, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Now we got like three designs. And so I was telling that story in Dayton, and one guy said, one guy it was the city of Dayton, and he said, I got one of those. <laughs> and I drew a drum picture on a whiteboard. And after lunch, we went out, and he showed me the nozzle, and there it is. And you can't quite see the, the jet itself, it's right there. But here, maybe, can you see that a little better? Look at what happened to that orifice from the water. In fact, the side of the body of the nozzle is blown out here. I think I have another one here. Here's a radial nozzle. Look at the wear on that steel. And so, this nozzle was no longer effective. This nozzle was used long after it could do its job. The, that orifice there, when, it, when that nozzle was new, it was probably half that diameter. So having the, the inserts made out of some other material was valuable for us. But here's sort of where I start to uh, look at uh, variability in the designs of the inserts themselves. And you say, okay, I do want a nozzle that's got some flow characteristic to it. You can just look down the barrel and you can see it. There's a bunch of different designs out there. Some of them, some manufacturers like to use tubes. I happen not to be a believer in the science behind that. But I am a believer in the materials. Albert made his inserts, the early inserts had a, a disc that, with a small hole in the center, and that, that created the orifice in the nozzle. And the, and the earliest discs were made of sapphire. And they picked sapphire because it was extraordinarily hard. But what else do we know about sapphire? It's brittle. Huh? It's easy to break. It's, it's brittle. It's also very expensive. And so Albert found somebody who could make discs out of ceramic. And the industrial ceramics were pretty hard then. They've gotten even harder today. Today, ceramics were so hard that we're using them as cutting tools in machine shops, harder than carbides. And they'll last longer. And so, uh, Albert had created the first insert design using that was mass produced uh, that 
was made out of a ceramic material. Over here, we've actually had some knuckleheads who said, well, I can't get that, that kind of sophisticated stuff, so I'll drill some different size holes and some set screws, and that'll be a replaceable insert. How many, how many of us have a couple of those nozzles in the toolbox somewhere, nozzles with set screws in them? And we drill the hole in it, and that's a, that's a replaceable insert. Um, sometimes we would, our pension is to sort of go for cheap. Seems like over there, money isn't the key driver, performance is the key driver. And so today, this would be uh, a cross section of an early uh, jet insert. And that, this section here, this gray area, is a, is a cross section of the disc, the ceramic disc, right? So the, whole, the steel part was the holder, and the ceramic disc was the actual jet. But there's a problem with this design. So if those green arrows represent the water, what can you see right away about the water flow in that design? You didn't make a disc. Yeah, a lot of the water is hitting the, the back of the disc, right? It's only the water molecules in the center that are happy. So what happens right there where the water is hitting the disc? You get a, a, an incredible amount of turbulence. It's actually cavitation. And cavitation robs performance. And so what manufacturers did to solve the cavitation issue was they put a little thin sheet metal doodad called a flow straightener in there that would calm down the turbulence, but it had an unwanted effect on the jet stream itself, which would be the next topic I'll cover in just a minute. When you put a flow straightener behind that to, to uh, cure the cavitation problem, you get a jet shape that's almost laser-like. Very narrow, very forceful, and very straight. It works great in control rotation nozzles, but it doesn't work very well for static nozzles, and we'll see why in a minute. So, when we thought initially that this design was good, today I would call it decent. And now, the, the most modern inserts aren't discs anymore, they're sleeves, and the inside is cone shaped. And so, when you look at how the water travels through that sleeve, you can see that it's a much more efficient transfer. And, he, and here's physics. You don't have to be a physicist to understand this, but we can't compress water, right? Everybody know that? You can't compress water. Anybody ever deadhead a pump? <laughs> you find out in a hurry, water doesn't compress. Not even a little bit. Uh, so the physics of that is, if this is the channel, if the channel narrows, and I'm pushing more water in at constant pressure, then in the narrowed section of the channel, the water has to accelerate. And so in this design, the water comes out of the jet at a higher velocity with more energy still left in it. And remember I said a couple minutes ago that my single-minded focus is to help you deliver the maximum amount of energy to the pipe wall. That's all I can do for you. So everything that I do is how can I help you deliver the maximum amount of energy to the pipe wall. Think about a pressure water washer for a second, right? If I'm at a stubborn spot on my sidewalk, and I'm standing here with my pressure washer nice and relaxed, right, and I'm blasting that stain or oil or grease or gum or paint or whatever it is on the sidewalk, I'm trying to get it off, and it's not coming up, what do I do? Get closer, right? I bring it down closer. And why? <coughs> it's, it's, it may be not immediately apparent why, but because there's more energy concentrated, right, when I get down closer. So if I imagine that pressure washer here in this room and I was going to hold that wand straight out, that water would travel a distance. And you see somewhere out there, maybe 20 or 30 feet away, you see a wet spot in the ground where the, the energy completely left the water and it just, gravity took over and it fell and it made a wet spot on the ground. And the way the physics of that works is, roughly speaking, every time I double the distance the water has to travel, I lose half my energy. So, you know, for the 
guy in the light blue shirt about 30 feet away from me, if I threatened you with my pressure washer from here, you'd still probably be willing to give me the finger. But this guy, not so much. <laughs> right? He's, he's going to be a little bit more respectful. Just because the, the distance that the water travels dissipates all the energy. There's a non-scientific term for it uh, called it went away. <laughs> it's really because of friction. The water is passing through the atmosphere and colliding with atmosphere molecules and they're taking the energy out of the water. So in instances like this, with a, with a more efficient flow here in this area, I'll not only probably wear longer, the superior flow characteristics will allow me to maximize my energy delivery. Does that make sense? So if you're looking at nozzles, and, and, and one of my fellows out there, I would say 99% of the sales guys out there that do what I do were friends, but there isn't any one of us who won't say, I don't have the best stuff. That's just sort of the way the sales guy works. But now you, you know something right away. You're going to make a decision when you leave here. What am I interested in? Am I going to save money? And I'll take anything. I'll take what was on the truck. I work with a lot of the manufacturers, and I mean no difference to them, but I can tell you that the nozzle that they deliver is the nozzle that the purchasing guy bought cheap. It's not meant to be the best performing tool that goes in the truck. They usually deliver the jetter with a nozzle, and they wanted to save as much money as they could so they don't add more cost to their bill. Doesn't make them bad, but it's the reality. But, so you already know a couple of things now, right? You know that if I'm looking at a real steel nozzle, I'm probably interested in price, and I'm probably not interested in performance. If I'm looking at a nozzle with inserts, and it's, a, and it's a drilled set screw, run. And if it's not, if it's one of the better materials, but it's using flow straighteners, and it's not on a rotation nozzle, it's going to give me a laser-like spray, maybe you want to consider you know, looking at what the next guy's got. So, what about a nozzle shape? We talked about the inside of the nozzle, we talked about the, the, the shape of, of the design of the jets. What about a nozzle shape? Does that matter much? To me, meh. There's a bunch of different nozzles there. Really all I care is that there's some kind of streamline, stream uh, effect. Uh, I think of the hull of a submarine. That's, I figure the Navy has the ability to come up with like the best design for efficiency. And they're not especially pointy or they, you know. All I want to know is that you're going to get over an offset, or get around a corner, pretty much. We can design the outside any way we want. How about a nozzle's name? <laughs> How important is that? To uh, the customer. <laughs> that's way important, right? Uh, you know, there's all kinds of crazy names out there. The, the Terminator, the Blue Thunder, the, the um, Ravager, the, uh, the, the, the Badger, the Angry Badger. It's just you know, there's all kinds of silly names out there, and uh, you know they just they don't really be the hill of beans. So the shape is uh, is probably a secondary consideration to how the nozzle is built. So then, what do I mean, what do I mean by key attributes of proper jet design? And I started to talk about that the shape of the jet if it's laser light. What happens? So here's an example of uh, the importance of the jet angles. Now all the manufacturers publish our jet angles in our literature. And NASCO talks about it on the NASCO website. Um, but so this section will give you another little bit of another little pearl to take with you. We will talk for just a minute about jet angles. So I'm a nozzle designer. And I've said that the key thing for me is to deliver the maximum amount of energy to the pipe wall. So there are ways to do that, right? Um, one is to get close to the pipe wall, right? We talked about the pressure washer and, and what happens with the distance. So if I had my jets come straight out the sides like that, that's a 90 degree angle to the hose, right? 
right? We call that a 90. And I just want to be clear, I'll, I'll explain how the, this degree works. It's the degrees off the hose. So 90 degrees off the hose, those jets are going to travel straight up against the jet, the pipe wall. Would you, could I get an amen that that's probably going to deliver the maximum amount of energy to the pipe wall? Amen. Amen. Would you agree? Well, what's wrong with that nozzle? It's not going to travel, right? It can't move. It may not dislodge things. It's just pushing them into the side wall instead of trying to... It might. It would probably embed stuff into the wall, right, depending on the material. Although, you know, you, we've all played with it with the pressure washer, right? If I go straight down on top of something, right on it, you know, that real stubborn one, that's probably what's going to break it free. Although, you know, maybe it's gum. I sort of want to get a little bit at an angle and try to get under it to get, work it loose, right? All those things play for us. But so this nozzle would want to deliver the maximum amount of energy to the pipe wall, but it's not going to go anywhere, so I can't use it. Now, how about this nozzle? What's that nozzle going to be good for? Nothing. Nothing. Getting down the pipe, right? Wearing out your hose. <laughs> Wearing out your hose. Actually, it's true. If the, if the jet angles come much inside about 11 degrees, you'll actually tear the jacket off your hose. You remember that one worn nozzle with the apron of the nozzle? The steel was worn away from the jet because the jet angles were too steep. But so a nozzle like this is designed for what? Travel. Travel. Climbing hills. Climbing hills. <laughs> Pulling. Thrust. The Europeans have a very quaint, I think it's a quaint uh, word in their catalogs, they call it traction. So it didn't translate perfectly from German to English, but they call it thrust traction. But so zero degrees probably isn't ideal either. In my industry, we spend a lot of time and energy trying to figure out what's the right angle for the job. And so, in this case, this nozzle, 100% of the energy is dedicated to propulsion. But physics and physicists, bless their cotton socks, give us some science that helps us understand how that works. So here are two jets that are 45, right? Halfway between 0 and 90. And, and the, the strength of the jet, the blue line, can be measured as a vector. And it can be measured both with mathematics and visually, this, this, this beautiful thing about physics. What you see here is, you see this force vector? That's the cleaning energy. And then this guy is the thrust energy. And when a jet is at 45 degrees, the cleaning vector and the thrust vector are equal, or one to one. So I'm basically using half of my available energy for thrust and half of my available energy to clean. Make sense? It turns out that at 45 degrees or one to one, nozzles don't travel very well, so we have to generally give you more. When I change the jet angle to 35 degrees, notice it's a little tighter. Look at the difference now in the length of the cleaning vector and the thrust vector. I'm now spending almost two times the amount of energy on thrust that I am on cleaning. So if a light bulb starts to go off at all and you start to say, well, boy, I don't want to go too far past that because I don't want to reduce my cleaning too much, you'd be correct. The further I go off now to tighter angles, if I go to a 15 degree angle, this jet here, this jet here might, I don't know, hit the pipe probably down around here somewhere. And I'm using 10 times the amount of energy for thrust that I am for trying to scour stuff off the pipe wall. Make sense? So we've got to try to figure out what's the ideal range. And I have a theorem. Part, part of my history, when I started advanced, because I was technologically inclined, I was just a, a more technical guy, I jumped headlong into CCTV. And in my geography, I, I went, I, I didn't represent one of the four key CCTV manufacturers back then. I represented somebody who was probably fifth. But we took them to number one in our market. I think in our best years, we sold more CCTV than all the other guys combined. When the, when the free money went away, when the mortgage crisis hit, the cities ran out of money, 
I had to jettison all that big equipment. I actually went back to school, and in 2010, I got my MBA. Uh, I think education is incredibly important. That's why you're here. You know, you're here learning, and good for you. You know, for every person that's in this room, there's at least 10,000 more in your world that aren't here, aren't taking the time to educate themselves. But so, when I look at this formula here, and I realize somewhere between, say, 25 and 30 degrees, um, I'm at between two and two and a half to one. There's another factor that I observed, one of the benefits of being so uh, active in CCTV was, I got to see what the results of the cleaning were. In fact, when I compare myself to my colleagues, I, I think I probably have more CCTV time than any of the nozzle guys do. And I could see what worked and what didn't. And I developed this theorem in my own mind that said, I don't want the jet path length, that's this guy, the length that the water travels, to exceed the diameter of the pipe. I felt that that was pretty important. That once the water traveled too far, if I look at that, look how far when the nozzle is centered perfectly in the pipe, that water is going to travel before it's going to hit the pipe. It's going to have maybe a quarter of the energy of that water. So the jet length is very, very important, and that's decided by the jet angles. When you see nozzles that are down below 20 degrees, they're for pulling. They might work good if you're dealing with sediment, but in the vast majority of our pipes, where the water flows is usually clean. Drains and gravity sewers, almost always you go in the gnarliest pipes and where the water is flowing, the pipe's clean. The problem's from the water line or across the crown to the other water line. So if I have a nozzle that's sitting on the bottom of the pipe and I have a jet that's traveling at 15 degrees, it, in an 8 inch pipe it might be 8 or 10 feet before it hits the pipe, 6 or 8 or 10 feet before it hits the pipe hole. So how much energy am I delivering to the pipe hole? I'm pretty much just wetting it. Does that make sense? So I've got to open that jet angle to something in that 20, 20 to 30 degree range. But then the next thing is the shape of the jet. Remember the flow straightener creates the laser-like spray? We need the jets to flare. They've got to open up because if I'm using a fixed nozzle, and say I have eight jets, I want those jets to open up so that we're at the spot where they hit the pipe wall, each jet begins to overlap. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, if it doesn't open up, then I'm going to end up with streaks in the pipe. I have a picture of it, and I'll show it to you there. There's a pipe that had been cleaned. But what did they, they clean? They just left streaks in the line, so it wasn't really effective cleaning. So I want the jet to flare. And it turns out that the physics of it is, if I use a jet with a, with a conical shape, uh, ceramic insert, the, the water leaving the jet mirrors the cone shape going in approximately. And so I begin to get a controlled flare. And the idea that uh, I just described is that as these jets hit the pipe wall, they just begin to overlap. I don't want them to overlap too much because it's like using a fan spray, and then it doesn't work either. So we begin to understand that it's a combination of the the angle of attack, the distance the water has to travel, and then the shape of the jet to get a pipe clean. That takes us to the importance of nozzle orientation, and this is where we start to differ between plumbing and municipal work. For plumbers, you're in small pipe, and it's hard to put any kind of a centralizing device on a, on a nozzle. Um, you don't have straight access, you've got bends, um, you've always done it without it. But I just want to run through a couple of slides quick and describe the importance of nozzle orientation, and then I'll, I'll get into the differences a little bit. Here's my nozzle with my ideal jet angle. And you can see that the length that the water is traveling, when the nozzle is centered in the pipe, is about the diameter of the pipe. That's sort of my postulate. An 8-inch pipe, I don't want that water to go more than about 8 inches because I still have a lot of energy left in that water. If I take that same nozzle and put it on the bottom of the pipe, I just let it run where it will, 
Now look what happens. Look at all the focused energy right there. That's like my pressure washer an inch off the spot on the sidewalk. I'm going to blast the heck out of the pipe there where it's clean. And I've now allowed my nozzle to, to be positioned as far away as I could from the problem. Grease collects at the water line and across the crown. Roots almost always come in from about the midline north. How many, uh, am I wrong? I'm right, right? So why would I let my nozzle sit there? If I was dealing with sediment, it, it would be okay. But for everything else, which is like 90 some percent of what we do, I probably want to bring my jets closer to the problem. The city of Summerlin called me in, said, JP, we've been cleaning this pipe, and it, we, you know, we knock ourselves out, we pretty well know where the problem is, and uh, after we clean it, we, we're still coming back a month later. We still get calls. So I said, well, let me come up and I'll watch what you're doing and see what we can think about. And so they put their nozzle on their hose, and they ran this line, and they spent a couple of minutes at the footage that they thought this was at. And then we went in with the CCTV. And that's what we saw. Clean roots. So they put a nozzle without any kind of uh, nozzle orientation management. And they ran past that thing, and the nozzle just ran right under it. Those, that, those roots were hanging down to the bottom and probably growing along the pipe maybe a couple of feet. And so they managed to remove a lot of it. But what did they do? The, the roots that were left were pissed. Right? They're angry, and they're just going to grow back faster and thicker. So we've got to consider jet path length. I'm just going to blast through these because they're giving me time. You see how even in centered in the pipe, that's kind of the, the ultimate jet length. And down here, you can see I'm probably going to be completely ineffective in cleaning the pipe. I might want to use a nozzle like this because I have a big hill. That's the, sort of the last section. But the proper challenge for that would, the proper response to that would be use the pulling nozzle to get up to the next manhole, gaff it, put a cleaning nozzle on, and come down. There's also some other cool technology out there. If you think of the word switcher, you'll find that out there. Here's a nozzle that's unmanaged. What I mean is, the operator is in the pipe and he's just got the nozzle attached to the hose. And I can tell you that nozzles pretty much do two things. They either, they're heavy enough and they ride the bottom of the pipe, which, unless I'm dealing with sediment, that's not where I want them to be. Or, they'll sort of porpoise. Right? They'll, they'll want to fly. Look at this nozzle. What's wrong here? I have to look. What we talked about, what's wrong? The nozzle's porpoising, right? Banging off the crown of the pipe. Too long and some are too short. You got a couple jets real short, some real long. The jets aren't meeting either, right? The space between the jets means that that's the nozzle that cleaned that pipe with the streaks a few minutes ago. It's not rotating. So this may not be a rotator. And in this, in this pipe, happens to be the problem is on the bottom. <coughs> so that's the effect you get when the spray isn't right. The nozzle isn't, the, the pipe just isn't clean. And what were we here to do? Clean the pipe. <laughs> so, there are a bunch of ways to manage nozzles. Um, you've heard of nozzle extensions, and even plumbers, I recommend, if you can do it, you just put a piece of straight pipe. Don't go to Home Depot and buy a piece of black pipe that's rated for 200 PSI. But there are nozzle extensions, which is just a small section of straight pipe, which will allow you to protect yourself. There's a bunch of reasons, I think, for using these. The guy down at the bottom is called a proofer. This is a proofer here. And this is a secret weapon for municipalities and for large line contractors. Remember that Summerland picture? That's us in a lot of days, if we're not aware. We're running on the bottom of the pipe, we're running the segment, we come back, we're convinced that the pipe is clean. But I'm going to uh, submit that we spend in our business probably somewhere around 90% of our time cleaning clean pipe. Right? You relate to that? You know what I mean by that?
The problem in a lot of pipes, if it's a grease line, it can be the whole line. But a lot of times with roots or other problems, there's just sections of the pipe that are bad. And I wish I could, I could see what I was doing. I could spend the time on that section. I could be a lot more effective. Right? And this is a secret weapon. That root mass, if this was on the, on the nozzle, and this thing hit the root mass, the nozzle would pass right through it. But look what happens here. The proofer gets stuck. And where are the jets? Right at the problem, right? So if I'm the operator, I see some sag in my hose, and I realize, okay, I'm, I'm up against something. The first thing I think is, duh. You know, there's like this pause where I'm trying to think, okay, what's going on here? So then when I gather my thoughts, I back the machine up and I hit it again. And eventually I'll get it through, get through the problem. And, and the beauty of a proofer is that it, stuck, it hangs me up where the problems are. And the name proofer comes from, if I can get from one manhole to the next with this guy behind my nozzle, I've proved the line is clear. Does that make sense? Sure. When are you putting a camera on one? Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the industry is all about it. The industry is all over. There's some cool stuff out there. This is a little different than a regular extension in that this end of the fins are fixed. This end, they're allowed to move. So if you hit a protruding lateral or an offset, the thing won't get lodged to where we got to dig. We should be able to, it'll compress a little bit. I should be able to wrestle it out. Sure. Um, there's, there's, here's, here's a picture of a nozzle properly centered in a pipe on a proofer. And I just kind of want to touch this. The importance of nozzle extensions, the various kinds that you saw in those pictures, there's three reasons for it. One is, nozzle extensions are relatively cheap. Uh, 75 to 100 bucks, that guy's a couple hundred bucks, that proofer. Um, nozzles are expensive. Wear out, the, wear out the, the nozzle extension. The second thing is, a nozzle extension starts to get the nozzle up off the bottom of the pipe. If you won't use a proofer to get the nozzle in the center, then you at least use an extension to raise it up off the bottom. Those jets laying on the bottom are doing almost nothing. They're not getting a chance to open up at all, so all they're going to do is streak the bottoms, and the top's just going to get wet. So if I raise it up, centering the nozzle of the pipe gives me a, a pretty good cleaning benefit. There's a third reason. Uh, when I, my first year running Cerepo, as the president of the company, I got to deal with all the legal stuff. And we got sued, an operator on the East Coast was killed by a jet. The nozzle turned around the pipe, it was a female operator, and uh, the sound was different than uh, the manhole, and uh, she looked over the manhole, and the nozzle came up and it gutted her. Oh my God. Yeah, we got sued. It gives me chills to say, oh. you know. Uh, we got sued because we made the machine. You know, everybody got, like, Parker got sued, they made the hose. Um, but nozzles can turn around the pipe, especially the big pipes. So it's a safety issue. So really, really, really important consideration. In the smaller pipes, plumbers, three inch and four inch laterals, not much likelihood a nozzle can turn around. But wherever possible, it's just as good practice, standard operating procedure. Try to put something to make sure that the, the nozzle plus the little straight section where it's attached to the hose is longer than the diameter of the pipe. It has to be, so they can't come around. You don't know. You, you, you know you, how many guys, how many plumbers have been in a pipe where the bottom's completely rotted out? Right? So the nozzle can deflect off some debris and make a turn. When it's pulling away from me, it's got the weight of the hose behind it, the drag of the drivetrain of the reel. It can go away at a pretty good clip. But when it turns around and comes back and it doesn't have all that drag behind it, it'll come back fast enough for you that you can't react to it. You do not want those things out of the pipe. But it helps me make my argument anyway that centralizing the nozzle in the pipe gives me a better performance. This was given to me by the guys of the city of LA. That's a video inspection of a pipe at 189 feet before and after. That's a pretty gnarly rooted pipe. I'm sorry that it's not brighter than the top picture. There's the same pipe at 205 feet. That was a nasty, rooted, crappy, grimy line. And look at the condition of the clay. There's a picture of a nozzle and a proofer in a pipe with a proper jet pattern. So based upon the things that we talked this morning, what are some of the things you can observe looking at that picture? 
close the center to the pipe. Spray fans out real good. It's sitting 360, isn't it? Look at where the nozzle is sitting. Is the nozzle on the bottom there? Look, look where it is raised up in the pipe. You, you, you can't exactly tell, but you can pretty much tell that that water is hitting the pipe wall pretty quickly. Right? I laugh when I see online the video of the manufacturers that attach a nozzle to the hitch on their pickup truck and show these streams of water, lasers, and brag about how they go in 30 feet. But what's that to me? That end, that's just wasted energy. But you can see these narrowly focused beams of spray that are traveling too close to the hose to be able to do, be of much effect. Your proofers, are you sizing them, what, 80% of pipe diameter? Or how Typically, you for an 8-inch pipe, you're using a 7-inch proofer. 6-inch pipe, you're using a 5-inch, usually 1-inch undersized. We don't want to get too close because of protruding laterals and offsets and stuff like that. But getting, that's pretty close to center. So, you know, there's that. Or that. Right? Which gives you that. Any questions? Sorry? I could. I, I just don't know that we'll have enough time. I'm happy to take some time afterward. When the question was to talk about rotating nozzles. As far as uh, replaceable inserts, when do you judge it's time to replace them? How are you looking at them determining that they reach their serviceable life and they're done? The good ceramics now last a long time. Several years of every day. Um, I use a mic. We use pin gauges to measure them. You can use number drills, which will help you a little bit. Um, number drills are varied by about three or four thousandths. My pin gauges are every thousandth of an inch, so I can measure it very, very closely. So you're not, say, necessarily noticing performance while you're in the pipe, but you're just checking them right What you might notice on your machine is that you can't get the full pressure anymore. So what happens is the hose poles widen. I'm not getting enough back pressure. Volume comes up. Volume comes up, and I and my peak pre I can't reach the same peak pressure anymore. That will that'll be an indicator for you. We didn't get to talk about special conditions. I hope that's not a problem for you, but I'm happy to stay here for a little bit and uh, see you out on the trade show floor. Thank you. Thank you for coming this morning.